Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. I know you have places to be, so I definitely appreciate you uh, spending your time with us. And I want to give a hats off to Iman, all the staff, and everybody that made this possible. It's number one. Number two, everybody, I want you to engage the art of possibility. Let me say that again. I want everybody to engage the art of possibility. Uh, what I mean is anything can happen. You can engage funny things, you can engage thoughtful things, but the most important thing is anything is possible. When we talk about comedy, comedy is comedians lie. We lie. We, we, we like gratitude. We want to be in front of folks. But the thing we most want and the thing you should look at also, even if you're not comedians or you're beginning writers or middle writers, advanced writers, is that you want to be able to write for purpose. You want to be able to elicit a certain emotion or reaction from people from things that you say. Uh, if I was a singer, it would be in my lyrics. If I was a musician, it would be in things I play. Uh, I grew up a little background. I started stand-up when I was 17 years old in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I was a freshman at Marquette University. Here's the problem. I was not old enough to go into any of the bars or any of the comedy clubs. So the only place that would let me work or work on my craft was a jazz club called the Jazz Estate. And so I wound up learning stand-up from actually from jazz musicians. And that influenced my style. Now, I have a clip. We're going to go to it in a minute because I think it's important for you to see some of the best stand-up that's out there. And I know a lot of people love Chappelle and all of that and then Kevin Hart, but there was a period where it was just a golden age of comedy. How many people have ever heard of Flip Wilson? Cool. So you're just as old as I am. Good. <laughs> Flip Wilson was a master storyteller and he was a master joke teller. So this first clip is a very famous clip. Uh, it's back from the 60s, I think it's 65. But the name of the clip is called Ugly Baby. <laughs> now, there's a couple of things I want you to look for. I know I see some of you like, oh, stuff it right, said ugly baby. What well, is the reality? Every baby isn't pretty, isn't that right? You, just, you can be honest, everybody, everybody, every baby isn't pretty. Well, Flip Wilson encapsulates it in a story. And I'm gonna break the story down afterwards, but I want you to listen for things. Repetition movement and intonation repetition movement and intonation he does several things as a master comic to make this bit work so um can we roll that please we have it queued up yeah can everybody see the screen it looks good i was coming in from baltimore to do the show and well i was on the train there and I'm settling my seat. I'm very relaxed, very relaxed. And the first thought that passed through my mind was to familiarize myself with the surroundings. And I glanced across the yard, and I noticed that the lady occupying the seat there had her baby with her. Ugly baby. <laughs> Bad fucking baby. Now, generally, I'd hesitate about passing an opinion about somebody's kid, but this was, even if I don't say it, it's an ugly baby. <laughs> I only took one quick look, like, like that, and I saw And from the front of the coach comes this guy, the guys, he's had a few. And as he approached the section where the woman was with the baby, he stopped, and he stared, like that. And the, woman, the woman's watching. She's watching him from the corner of her eye. She says, so what are you looking at? The guy says, I'm looking at that ugly baby. That's a bad-looking baby. Lady. a lot of money with that baby. <laughs> they don't have to hire any babysitter. Nobody's going to bother that kid. <laughs> she gets offended. Does that make sense? As he pulls the emergency cord, the train stop is a big scene in there. All everybody's crowding around it. And you know the guy who goes through the train selling those 25 cent sandwiches for a buck and a half. <laughs> He comes in, big thing, the conductor comes in, and goes, what's going on? What's going on? 
and ladies to this fellow just insulted me. And I don't have to spend my money to ride this railroad and be insulted. The conductor said, now calm down. He said, Madam, the Pennsylvania Railroad will go to any length to avoid having differences between the passengers. He said, perhaps it would be more to your convenience if we were to rearrange your seating. <laughs> and as a small compensation from the railroad, if you'll accompany me to the dining car, we'll give you a free meal. Maybe we'll find a banana for your monkey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can we can stop. <laughs> okay, that's probably one of the best written bits ever done on television. But let me tell you why. How often did he have to move off a spot? He never moved. Did you guys notice that? Body up, he was able to tell a joke. Every time he told a joke, he said, I'm looking at the ugly baby, he would look down. He created an environment. So there's a conversation that's happening. He represented one, two, three people in a conversation. The baby never speaks, of course, because the baby is, it's a baby. But I want everybody to understand the nuance of being able to bring something out. When you're talking about comedy, comedy, you're looking for a certain emotion, which is, it, it brings out laughter, but you want a reaction, laughter. When you're doing writing, particularly comedy writing, I want everybody to understand that you're not gonna see your audience if you're not a comedian. Did that make that clear? Yes, no? You're not gonna see your audience. So when you're writing for comedy, it might be television or movies or things like that. Now I always break down, um, I always ask the question, when you're doing comedy writing, who are you writing for? So I want you to write that down or remember that question for yourself. Who are you writing for? For some of us, it's to be a stand-up. Uh, some people have aspirations to write for television. Some people just want to strengthen their writing skills. Some people can only write drama. They want to write comedy. Some people use writing comedy or stuff like writing comedy to improve communication skills. <clears throat> it's important to identify why you're writing and who you're writing to. Let me say it again. Why you're writing and who you're writing to. So I want to give you now the Bible of comedy writing, if that's okay. Everybody still with me? Let me know if I'm talking too fast. I used to be a school teacher, believe it or not. That's why the kids can't read. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know how you know you do, you do writing and narrative? You say who, what, where, how, when? Have you heard that before? In comedy, it's a little different. Comedy writing. Of course, it's who, what, where, when. But the how is how funny. And the why is why is it funny. Who, what, when, where. Why is it funny? And I always say not how is it funny, but how funny can it be? So the first letter in comedy for all of you is not a C. It begins with a P. It's called premise. And you have to be able to establish a strong premise to do any kind of writing. Comedy writing, drama, if you're preparing for court, Whatever, if you're a lawyer, if you're putting a proposal together, you have to be able to frame a strong premise. Comedy writing is probably very difficult. It's an art form in some regards because the premise has to move several times within a performance. This is a course basically to allow you to focus on one premise. One, to be able to tell a story effectively and hold to a premise. Like I personally believe, she's not around here, but I personally believe that my daughter 
was trying to get me killed recently. <laughs> what happened was we were driving. I got pulled over by the police. And, uh, you know, I don't want any problems. I had my hands on the wheel, 10 and 2. The cop walks up, rolls down the window. He's like, do you know why I pulled you over? I wanted to say it because I'm a black man in Texas with hope. But I couldn't say that. I said, um, I don't know why you pulled me over. He actually tells me the reason I pulled you over was because you were texting and driving. And I was shocked. I'm, I'm arguing with the guy. I'm like, I'm not texting and driving. He goes, yes, you were. I'm like, no, I'm not. He goes, yes, you were. My daughter jumps in the middle of it. She goes, Mr. Officer, you are wrong. And I'm like, go ahead, girl. She goes, no, my daddy was not texting and driving. I was like, yeah. She said, mm-mm. He was reading his emails. Premise, driving, police car, argument, resolution. What's the premise? What I said, I thought my daughter's trying to get me killed. Do you remember I said that at the beginning? It's not a serious premise. It's just that I didn't expect for her to be honest that way. <laughs> and that's what makes it funny. With Flip Wilson, there are tricks to it. The reason why that's a very well-written joke, Ugly Baby, you know what he does? The first minute of a joke, it's only a two-minute joke, but then the first minute he said the word baby five times. Five times. Repetition. Did I say repetition early? Tone. He didn't say baby the same way every time. Baby, 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 baby. Man, get something for your monkey. Every time he's building a story, and I think everybody should understand about how we build stories. So I, we have a really good group here, but I want you to write down something that you think is funny, but frame it in terms of a premise. I'll give you an example. I had a relative that called me and I knew he wanted money. So what I did was I came up with any conversation so we didn't get to the conversation about money. So he go, man, how you doing? I'm like, I'm doing good, man. He said, you know what? How's your mom? <laughs> your dad good? By the time we finished, I gone through every first, second, and third cousin that he had because I didn't want to give him any money. That's a premise. Think something different. I talked about the police officer. There are things that I, I, I laid it out. I said, this is what I said, what I wanted to say, but what I actually said. The premises built in between premises built in between premises. What are the things that are important to you? What are the things that sometimes drive you a little crazy, but you still love them? It might be your husband, it might be your wife, it might be your kids. You know, what's the premise? Now I need everybody, if possible, Put the P word, premise, and right underneath it, put the word possibilities. Premise and possibilities. The more possibilities that you can come up with, the better your narrative is going to be. Does that make sense? The more possibilities you come up with, the more narratives you're going to be. Like, um, it's a good, it's a, it's a, it's a great exercise. Sometimes you have to do a semantic map. You draw a circle, and then you write your premise in it. Uh, what is it? COVID, COVID nineteen. I put my premise, don't want to be coughed on. That's my premise. I don't want to be coughed on. How do you not be coughed on? It's like, well, I forget six feet, I stay 60 feet. As a result, my wife and I are now divorced. <laughs> It's okay to laugh, people. These, we're talking possibilities. It hasn't happened yet. 
She's 70 feet, but she can't hear me. Have you ever used COVID-19 not to have a conversation with people? Sometimes it's not even COVID-19, it's just bad breath. It's okay to laugh. What are the reasons? This is a premise I wrote down. This is a premise. Don't want to be coughed on. Some of us are going through situations we, we may have lost work. You know, there's a premise. I can't do what I used to do. Or uh, there was a great comedian named uh, Pigmeat Markham. He used to always do this thing about uh, getting locked out of his apartment because he couldn't pay to pay the uh, he couldn't pay the rent. There's a great bit called "Open the Door, Richard," and he would say, "Richard, I know you're in there because I know I know you're in there because I got your clothes on," which is the funniest line. But I want to find some people have some premises. Uh, can we open up the, the the mics and have some people give me a premise? So I just want to make sure I get this. Is the premise the whole story or it's just like the beginning of the story? Beginning of the story. It's the core idea. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I'm phrasing this right, but we're talking possibility. Remember, I told you put premise and possibility. Okay. So I guess my premise is uh, trying to not read all the WhatsApp messages that my family sends me, but wanting them to still think that I'm in touch with them. <laughs> well, that's a good premise. That's a good premise. Give me another premise. Hmm. Raise your hand. I'm going to start calling on people. That's the way I am. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's me. OK. Uh, the premise is that COVID-19 is making me nervous about everything. So uh, when I got back in the house, I don't know if this is too much as possible. When I got back in the house, I was like, oh, which apps did I use? I got to disinfect those too. Yeah, exactly. I tell people don't call on this phone. <laughs> don't call them. So question, does the premise have to be funny or it's just an idea? Just an idea. Okay, well, I was, there's something to me in making these face masks. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but there's something in there. <laughs> okay, that, that's a funny premise. People trying to make face masks. I'm making face masks. Are you making face I'm masks? one of those people. <laughs> okay, there you go. Now you gotta be like, what's the premise that you make? Part of the what? Part of the, uh, the who, what, where, where, why, when, and, and, and how funny and why it's funny is because people are actually talking about making face masks. Mm -hmm. Like I'm literally looking at a really nice shirt thinking that could save my life. There you go. Okay. Somebody else give me a premise, please. Okay, where, where am I? Where are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go okay, ahead. you can hear me, but you don't see me? See no, we too. can see you. We see you too. Okay. <laughs> Mine's, <laughs> mine's would be uh, going to the grocery store to get toilet paper. A possibility. It is a possibility. <laughs> but we don't have any. I want to laugh. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I'm going to lower my hand. I'm going to lower my hand, okay? You're a true believer. <laughs> So my premise is <laughs> made it real when you're out here dating because you start asking like, are you QT material? <laughs> dating was cool before COVID hit, but it makes it really honest about whether or not you want to be quarantined with somebody. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah, that, that, that should probably be in the, uh, the marriage contract. <laughs> are you good to be quarantined with? <laughs> when I want to be around you 24 hours in there. <laughs> Um, well, wasn't that another uh, pandemic? I'm pointing to the screen like people can see me. How about, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how about that uh, news clip about the, um, the, the Christian pastor who ignored all warnings and uh, still had services? And I'm thinking there's some wackos in all of these religions. 
Indeed, indeed. <laughs> How would you make a premise have, out of that? I have a premise. Okay. The comments that people leave on Instagram posts or YouTube videos <laughs> are off the hook. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Give me a give me a premise. How would you turn that into a premise? Like I went on Instagram and I saw. Right. Okay. There you go. How would you do that? Okay. All right. I just told Vince this one the other day. So that 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 um infectious disease doctor that's always at the Trump uh, at the pre the White Con House press conferences. How much she blinks. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody called her Blink 182 in a comment. <laughs> That's all of this is good stuff. How about my? How my? I'm gonna pick somebody. Nelani McClendon. How, how about you? My, I think a premise is what the pets are going through with this um, people staying at home because their space has really been invaded and they're they're their time you know they have to do a lot of stuff with their their humans now that's a that's a great premise i'm, I'm thinking sadly the cats are like hey we might have this place all to ourselves mm -hmm. <laughs> we done social distance mm -hmm. i like that one my sister layla layla's very funny everybody yeah here i am yeah mm -hmm. I, I, I knew you were gonna put me on the spot I've been sitting here trying to think of something to say. So what is my premise? Thinking of can something you, to say. Can you hear me? Of course I can hear you. Oh, OK. okay. And this is the screen thinking people can't hear you. Uh, this is my first time Zooming, too. So anyway. <laughs> um, OK, so my premise. Mm -hmm. um, OK, this is for real. This is a real thing. So. I've been a little anxious about leaving the house. <laughs> I figure I stay in my apartment by myself, right? But the other night, I had a taste for some Cheerios. It was kind of late. I was going to eat me a bowl of Cheerios, and I'm like, darn it, I don't have any more almond milk. So what do I do? Do I stay in and be safe? <laughs> or do I go get the milk? Did you, did, did you put the water in the milk? You know I thought about it. <laughs> cause I cause I know about that from back in the day, right? <laughs> All right. Uh can we get uh Fatu? All right. iPhone Fatu Fall. Aria, can you unmute her please? Yeah, I'm trying to put on the thing, but Um, there it is. You ask her to, um, they, it was unmuted. There you go. All right, now I got it. <laughs> All right. Everyone. You got a premise for us? My promise is uh, how is the mysteries are feeling now? You say that again? The mistresses, how are they feeling now? Oh, the mistresses? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, Unemployed for right now. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people finding out about their marriages right now. There you go. <laughs> you know you're in trouble when you say this to your wife or your husband as soon as this pandemic is over. Really? Okay. <laughs> How about Becca? Becca, what you got for us? The premise is that, that calm is dangerous. It's a premise that comes from parenting and every day, like if things sound a little, if things are quiet, you don't want to give in to the joy because you know something terrible and dangerous is probably happening somewhere else and you're going to find out about it soon. Uh, so it's like, you can't even, just don't enjoy that. If you, if you enjoy something for a minute, rethink that. Okay. Okay. I like that. Bentu, how about you? B, Miss B. Oh, man. Okay, so my premise is that my brother never thinks I'm funny, but I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how to make it into actual scenario. But yeah, he I t I tell really really long stories, so that's it. It's not okay. funny because I'm not funny, but 
Well, that that might that might be the premise. It's the premise or the truth. One of the two. What? That's it. That's uh. Ooh. Let's go to Marv. Marv has some stand up that he hasn't even done yet. Marv. Marv has premises. I know he does. So so the one premise I had was <clears throat> sort of the the somebody else mentioned this, but I think this is funny. So the dogs are behind this whole pandemic, right? Because now they get all kinds of attention and walks and. There's other groups like kids and other people that, you know, are, could be behind this. And then like what you said, Preacher Moss, I think the cats are like, when are you all going back to work? Just get out of here, you know? So I think that's a funny premise. The other premise I had that I, I want to work on and I've been working on a little bit is this whole idea that, that testosterone should be considered a controlled substance. And sort of this whole idea behind, you know, that kind of, addiction to testosterone and you know kind of that whole kind of slant so anyway no i, I like though that. that's it's a good premise it's a good premise uh let's try alia and we'll go to anna okay my dog may bark in the middle of this um okay. so my premise is that my white mom is more arab than my arab family and it would revolve around her trying to convince me to come home to Alabama instead of stay in isolation in Chicago. That's a funny thing. Thank you. And the dog thinks so too. Anna, I see you look like you have something for us. It's not fully fleshed out, but two that come to mind. One is thinking about my pantry right now and how much it must already be sick of me opening it multiple times while I'm stuck at home. Mm -hmm. And then the other is something about like a work meeting and trying to find five different technologies and not none of them working. That's, that's good. I like the first one. The first one is a strong premise. Uh, Indica. No, we did that. We did, we did that one. Hold on a minute. Brenda, sit down. <laughs> I see you, Brenda, sit down. Uh, how about Umar? Are you there, Omar? Okay. Uh, Miss Wright, Anna Wright. Question. Okay, hold on. We got Omar. Yes, sir, brother Omar. Omar? Omar, are you there? We'll come back. Uh, Miss Anna Wright. Oh, thank you. Um, hi. So the only the only thing that's coming to my mind is like, with my job before the pandemic, I never saw my coworkers. I worked downstairs by myself. Everybody was upstairs. But now since this, like, I have to see them. I'm always on a Zoom meeting. They're obsessed with like Google Hangouts and Zoom. So something around that, just like the obsession with that and how I could like fake being on Zoom and I'm really not there, but have my camera on and like have a stunt double or something. Like I just, it's driving me crazy. Like I never see them and now I have to see them multiple times a day. Not that anything's wrong with them, but yeah. Something, something's wrong. It's <laughs> Nothing's wrong, but something's wrong. <laughs> it's a great premise. Uh, I, Kate? What you got for us? Oh, well, I feel like... Um... Oh, you went back on mute, Sister Jamila. You got to hit on mute. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I was saying, I feel like I'm losing my mind being inside because I'm not used to, I'm always, you know, out. But the funny thing happened the other day, my car went out, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm stuck, <laughs> you know? So I either go upstairs, main floor, basement, just to have some sanity, you know? So that's, so that's where I'm at. Now, all of the premises that everyone gave has a picture to it. All the premises that you gave have a picture to it. Um, I'm going to show you a Pre preacher Moss. Can I share one more premise? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, 
I have this this idea for a joke around how like we name nickname people that how do you say I don't even know how to say it. it's going to come off problematic so please excuse me but basically like how people like street beggars get nicknames for like their <laughs> characteristics I like that one I I used to do a joke about how um in how these days like um uh, you could tell who committed a crime in the newspaper if it's black or white because it was a black person uh they always give the nickname in the middle so it's not joseph williams it's joseph pookie williams <laughs> and just things like that and even in the mosque you know the, how people give themselves jobs in the mosque that aren't there like the guy that tells you where to park he's been there for 30 years but he doesn't have a car Little things like that, the premise, the small premises are the things that build out your story. Um, can we have a clip? Um, not the jazz clip, it's the one from the comic strip. Uh, it's really, it's really short. But the premise, it was an unfinished premise, but you get to see something on stage that I build out a lot later. Um, and ironically, it, it has a little something to do with the baby. Okay. Right, what's happening, black man? <laughs> hey, they've been waiting to get acknowledged all night. Is somebody looking at her? <laughs> so you got that tweet, huh? <laughs> all right, well. Yeah, I can't see all right, homie, we're going to get to it. <laughs> Don't scare everybody else, though. <laughs> Is the sound down? Yeah, we got to turn the sound up, Aria. Go! <laughs> Wait, are you, can you guys hear it? No, the sound went out. Just the very beginning. Okay, rewind it a little bit. Okay. Thanks. Okay, can you guys hear it now when I play it? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here. Uh, huh. Let's get some things out of the way. Um, I'm not one of them Muslims they're going to put on television when things go wrong. Because <laughs> I don't apologize. <laughs> hey, hey, what happened? That ain't me. That's where it goes, man. That's where it is. You know, they, they, America still has memory issues about black Muslims. Like I told somebody I was Muslim like, you know, almost 30 years. They were like, oh my gosh. So you were there with Malcolm X. <laughs> <laughs> like I was the warm up act at the Audubon. Right? <laughs> Crazy. I realized I've been Muslim all this time, but I still have some issues with race, I'm gonna be honest. I was on a plane recently, we're flying to New Jersey from LA, and most of the people on the plane were Chinese. That wasn't the problem though. <laughs> they held up the flight, that wasn't the problem. The problem was, you know, I'm sitting there chilling and I'm minding my own business and I see this elderly Chinese lady walking down the aisle, you know, she's like. <laughs> and then she stopped by my row and she dipped like this, and she had a little black baby on her shoulder. <laughs> so now I gotta have a conversation with the baby. <laughs> I'm like, hey, homie. <laughs> you good? <laughs> I'm adopt you right here, man. You know. So we can come out of it. So that's quickly how you can just set up a premise. That is the beginning part of it and everything else you put around it. Did you see how that works?
So your premise doesn't have to be long and engaging. Some of the best premises are really, really small. Um, borrowing a cup of sugar, asking your parents for money. All of these are all situational. And what they all have is the fact that there's going to be a reaction one way or the other. When you're writing stand up, like the story about the, the lady on the plane with the black baby was funny. Now, just so you know, the, the, the baby didn't talk to me. It didn't talk to me, but it looked at me and I'm like, I wonder if I should be talking to this baby and having a conversation like, hey, are you okay? Is everything good? The, the longer part of the joke was at this point in time in crisis, I said at this point in time in crisis, I realized that I have totally forgotten how to talk black baby. <laughs> so you're talking about language and things like that. Now, let me check out time. Great, 810. What I want everybody to focus on, really, really focus on, whether you're gonna be doing comedy writing or anything, is that aspect of premise and possibility. Most of the people don't do stand up because they'll write a premise and they won't look at the possibilities. Let me say that again. Most people wind up not doing stand up because they won't, they'll do the premise and they won't look at the possibilities. In your writing, leave a space to be really, really funny, to be really, really right, or to be really, really wrong, but leave that space for yourself. Does everybody understand that? It's called possibilities. Don't worry about being funny the first time or idea being killer the first time. It's a process. You're gonna to have to mature. When you write a joke, you're gonna to have to mature with a joke. The best quote I ever heard about stand up and writing wasn't from a comedian, it was from a musician, Thelonious Monk. And he gave it this way. He said, in music, and I use this myself. He said, in music, there are no wrong notes. He said, there are no wrong notes in music. He said, they're just better decisions. So there's no wrong notes in writing, it's just better decisions. When you have a premise, you're gonna make choices about which way you go. So if you were doing screenwriting, or you were writing for a television episode, this right here is like a writer's room that you would see in, in Warner Brothers or, or Universal. It's like a writer's room and everybody be throwing out ideas. What you're throwing out is premises. And whoever has the best premise or the strongest premise, everyone else gets on there and they start building it out. So <clears throat> again, look at when you're doing your writing, your tone, your flavor. What, do you, what kind of emotions are you trying to get from people when you're writing? Um, Brenda, you did a you did a you did a uh, a premise about going to the going to the uh, grocery store and there's no toilet paper. I could probably tell you with Brenda's premise, that anxiety is already building on the way to the grocery store. Almost like they better have some toilet paper in here, right? It starts building. Uh, Fat to fall, uh, iPhone, the. The whole thing about mistresses being out of work. Funny thing. Can they get uninsurement, unemployment benefits? <laughs> you start thinking about certain things. Um, uh, testosterone. And this is funny because I'm trying to pull out everybody's premise. Testosterone. Should it be a, a, a controlled substance? Um, when it's quiet in the house and you have kids, people will respond to you on WhatsApp, um, comments on Instagram. Um, I'm trying to remember all of these. I can't remember all my memory is that good, but you see how it goes, right? You're able to pull premises. It's like, this is how you write stuff. And I'm going to the pantry too many times. Technologies. You see what I'm saying? Uh, Dating, uh, you know, um, getting married. I won't say dating and stuff with the law. Look, um, getting married, you know, are you a good person in a, in a pandemic? Are you a good quarantine partner? 
um, uh, Sister Jamila is talking about the car being, being broken down and now you're really in the house. So these are all things. I'm just pulling them back, pulling them all back. And I'm going to tell you something really, really important because I, I see it's 814. And if anybody wants to um, talk afterwards, talk to Sadia and, and we'll work it out. Because I want everybody to walk away from these skills. I'm going to give you guys something really, really important that you should know. So please pay attention. Whether you're a wannabe comedian, whether you want to communicate at work better, uh, whether you want to write for TV, whether you want to do technical writing. I told you the who, what, where, whens, how, and whys. Here's the other thing that you have to know about, particularly when you write entertainment. And I'm going to take some questions as soon as this is over. Here's the thing you have to understand. You may be the greatest writer in the world, but understand this, your audience is trained to receive information a certain way. Your audience is trained, I can be a great comedian or funny comedian, but it only comes understanding that the audience listens to jokes a certain way. Like you just can't go up and talk 45 minutes about nothing. It has to be a setup premise that they can hold on to and then you tell the rest of the story. They listen to it a different way, a specific way. And so when you're writing, uh, and this is probably a bigger conversation when you're writing, part of what you're writing is with the understanding of how people are receiving your information. This is important, just not in stand up or comedy writing, but people receive your information a certain way. I learned this with television writing. Uh, you, you have to have a certain amount of breaks. You have to you forget writing for TV. You have to write to commercials. People are trained to watch TV a certain amount of time because they know there's a commercial. And it's little nuances like that that I want everybody to have. But the most important thing you're going to get out of here today, or I hope you take, is learn to figure out a premise and refine it and refine it and refine it. Get your premise, refine it, refine it, refine it. The more you refine the premise, the easier you're going to find the funny stuff or the emotional stuff or the truthful stuff. But it comes from a very, very, I call this deliberate practice. Watch TV sometime. Well, we got a lot of time to watch TV. Watch TV sometime and, and understand the premise of the TV show or a particular episode. What are they trying to do? A uh, boy loses dog. The dog looks for boy. Boy doesn't want to tell mom he lost dog. He doesn't. Dog comes back on his own. These are the things that made millions of dollars on TV. I just described for you Lassie. So, if you're going to get anything out of this, and, 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 and Sadia, like I said, I, I'm totally open for people who want to, any more information, I'll give it to you. Work on your premises. Your premises is what, what we in business call your cell tape. Work on your premises. Brenda, Brenda, I'm going to send you some toilet paper too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you some too. All right. uh, somebody said, how long do you recommend? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get to this. How long do you recommend? I'm sorry, I can't see it. Somebody said, oh, one yeah, how long do you recommend a premise should be? I don't make it recommend it being a particular, I, I would recommend it being detailed. However it needs to be, let it be, but make sure it's detailed. When it's detailed, you have an opportunity to make more, make more decisions. You'll find more of the mind out of that premise. Um, when I talked about my daughter, I could have said my daughter is 12 and the joke is a lot funnier because it's a young lady, it's not a, you know, a 30-year-old daughter. 
is 12. Now she's trying to be an activist, things like that. You know, so work your premise, refine your premise. In the, in the business, a lot of times you don't have a whole lot of time to tell everybody your whole story. They're gonna like, what's the synopsis? That's your premise. And you could tell it in a minute, minute and a half. People might buy that. But in regular communication, if you can get to the point right away with folks, they're gonna to listen to you. They're gonna wanna be, they wanna engage in what you're talking about. If you're a salesperson, you can't talk about all this stuff over here. You have to have specific language to make the sale. And that's what the premise is. It's the beginning of your sale. Okay, um, do we have any other questions? I have one more clip to show. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we did have some questions. I can hold them to the end. Okay, well, I actually, mean. Actually, um, actually I'll, I'll ask one question real quick. Yes, B. That we got from the, from the chat. So um, can you expand a little bit on how jazz influence your comedy and like how that correlates between jazz and comedy? Well, um, <clears throat> historically, comedians were not featured artists. Comedians travel with jazz musicians and the jazz musicians were the featured artists. So in the world of stand-up, some of the best stand-ups in the world uh, have musical backgrounds. So if you ever want to watch Richard Pryor and his stand-up, Richard Pryor really learned his stand-up because Miles Davis took him on the road and toured. So he always had that thing. Um, you probably noticed, but Dave Chappelle is, Dave Chappelle is basically a guy who can't play piano. He loves piano, but, and I'm a guy that loves saxophone, but I, we didn't have efficiency, so we wound up in stand-up. But you learn something from music, which is tone, reflection, sonic, and emotion. So when I learned to write stand-up, I learned writing it, listening to jazz musicians. Well, okay, since we're, you know, we're gonna end in a few minutes, and um, I, I wanted to ask you, can you, I don't know if I mentioned this in your introduction, but can you tell us a little bit about some of the work you've done, like in the, in the prisons as a comedian, and how your comedy, like, is a service to people? Well, years ago, um, <clears throat> And like 2000, I want to say 2002, 2003, um, I started performing in the prisons, um, Colorado, uh, Illinois. And it, it was spurned by somebody who said something to me about actually being in the prison, which is, it still sticks with me. You talk about a premise. Um, I did a show, I did several shows as a matter of fact, because you have to perform for different groups so if you perform for the Muslims as one group, the Christians were called the God Pod, you know, uh, and then you have another group, you have the guards, whatever. But a guy said something to me about being there. He's like, I'm glad you came. And I was like, hey man, I, I love to do stand up. And you're giving them the, the public service announcement. We need to reach out. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, man, you don't realize. He goes, in prison, the ability to laugh at something is the last thing they haven't taken from you. And so in doing this show, <clears throat> it really heightened the fact that there are people who are in desperate situations right now. Um, choices have been made. Um, you know, uh, choices have been made. Reality is what it is, but there's still people. And to be able to laugh and to be able to make somebody smile is, you know, it's 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 a, it's a trust. It's like an amana. It's a trust, and you have to realize a lot of times when I'm saying tighten up your premises because you know what? Then you don't know that person who's going to be in front of you that needs to hear that laugh, to hear that story, um, and it doesn't have to be funny. Maybe it's just the thing that allows you to break down communication. So you don't spend two years trying to find that person. You spent two minutes, you know, trying to understand that person. You spent two minutes joking, smiling with that person, and it just makes communication and just functionality in society so much better. You know, the, doing prisons is interesting because that's like the ultimate ecosystem. You know, everybody's there for a wrong reason. And you're, you're there to make them laugh. And sometimes it's gonna be, it's gonna be tough. I had a couple of tough shows. Um, 
I had a really tough show. It was the, the sexual offender unit. And nobody laughed at that joke. Um, however, I still took it upon myself. Like, they still deserve to laugh at something, to smile. So, you know, Iman does a lot of work with um, prison reentry. And I'm hoping moving forward, uh, Saadi will be doing some shows for the inmates that you're involved with. Um, I, t I talked to uh, Shamar about actually premiering um, my comedy special with them. Uh, just, just as a give back, because you know, there's still important parts of our community, and we have to treat them as such. Yes, thank you, thank you so much for this whole um, workshop, this whole, and and to everybody on the call, like you guys have me cracking up back here. So appreciate what y'all shared, and for showing up with your energy. Um, I hold on, we're about to end. Oh, then you can ask me. Okay, so I just wanted to say on that note, um, um, basically that, you know, Iman is like, so currently right now what we're working on is a, um, in Chicago, in Illinois, uh, we are working on a holistic reform for inmates that are incarcerated, which includes like access to healthcare and like what, what Preacher Moss just mentioned right now, like just the ability even to connect with other people, specifically with family, um, and also the ability to practice spirituality. So one of our organizers, our um, criminal justice reform organizer is working on creating a committee to um, attach, uh, attack this issue. So if this is something that any of y'all are interested in, um, feel free to email arts at imancentral.org and we can connect you to this committee to make some lasting change in this state. It, it'll be a state, a statewide effort. And um, so I wanted to make that plug and that connection to some of the work that Preacher Moss is doing. I also wanted to let y'all know, congratulations y'all, y'all made history. You guys are the first ones in any internet site forever. So thank you all so much. And um, we'd love to hear your feedback on how to improve it. And then, um, also, this work is being supported by um, uh, Chicago Beyond, which is an incredible foundation in Chicago that's very near and dear to us. And they're, they're host holding this space specifically for people who are over the age of 60. So we're letting people, like reaching out to people in our communities that are over the age of 60 for all of these internet ciphers. We're reserving spots specifically for um, people over the age of 60 because of the vulnerability that um, people over the age of 60 face during this pandemic. So um, please, please let folks know, you know, your auntie, your cousin, your grandma, whatever, about these um, internet ciphers. And um, also just, yeah, so that, that but then also if, if anyone's interested in supporting any of the work that Iman is doing to respond to the pandemic, to our communities and to hold space for the artists, we sent out a survey to 40, 41 artists responded, and there was a net, uh, an anticipated loss of $136,000 through April 30th because of canceled shows. And these are people, a lot of them um, filled it out saying that, that being an artist is their primary source of income. Um, others had part-time jobs and like independent contractor work, but um, so it's a big, uh, you know, we want to hold space for the artists because uh, artists are also the ones who are getting us through this moment through Netflix and through, you know, creative content online, online and IG lives and stuff like that. So uh, this really is about holding space for the artists and for our communities. That's why it's called the Internet Cypher is because it's creating that net, that community. And um, uh, it's a space for us to go inward and, um, you know, to, to kind of dig deep inside. So thank you all so much again. Um, please fill out the survey that you get. And uh, like I said, if anyone's interested in being connected to Preacher Moss, he has graciously offered to, re to, to, to be in touch with you all. So just um, let us know. You can respond to the email you'll get or the arts, or just email us at arts at Iman Central and, and we're happy to make that connection. And Preacher Moss, I'm gonna turn it over to you to um, just close us out in just a, a quick spiritual prayer or reflection. Sure. Can we really quickly take a group photo? Yes, let's yeah. do a photo. So everybody, best smiles. Ready? I'm going to take it on the count of three. One, two, three. Got you. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I heard that. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> <laughs>
God, we ask that you protect our spirits, protect our souls, and protect our families. God is in the right way. Remove us from the wrong way. Let us be pure and one, meaningful to one another. During this time of this virus, we ask that you bless the sick and give them health. And for those that return to you, give them the highest levels of heaven. Forgive our flaws, accept our good deeds, allow, let us improve day by day and follow your word, I mean. Peace, everyone.